in the garage. It was a climate-controlled environment. <laughs> um, and then following that, we'll kind of go through some pictures of some of the history of St. Peter's, and of course, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, got a little history lesson going on this morning. So we were doing some work in the sacristy and uh, took off the inner wall and exposed a tin plate, which someone thought, well, was there a chimney going through the wall? What was that? Well, it turned out to be a time capsule. So um, attrition it has been when you build buildings, you put a box with memorabilia in it, you put it in the cornerstone, and that stays there until the building gets torn down or something, else, something happens. It's, it's entombed. Um, we found it, and well, now what do we do with it? So we decided to open it up. The congregation wanted to open, asked the con council to open it up and, and see what was inside of it. So this video, you can go ahead and start the video, um, is a kind of a short version of what we did. So the box was actually double seam tin with a soldered top on it. So it took us a little while. Um, unfortunately, the double seams weren't waterproof, so it got water in it. So the articles that were in the box, you'll see in the, uh, on the table back there, the, what's in those plastic bags, those were the actual articles in the box. So it consisted of uh, a German and English Bible, a German and English hy hymnal, a, a German catechism, uh, the precursor to the Forward in Christ uh, magazine we get now, the Northwestern Lutheran, um, and the, a newspaper from November 27th, 1925. That was the day, the Friday, before the dedication that happened on that Sunday. All very fragile, most legible. Uh, you know, you could find, well, within reason, of course, but... <laughs> You know, as we opened each thing up, it was, well, what, what, try to figure out what it, what it is. You only saw some of it. The newspaper was actually totally saturated, but you could, I, I was able to take it home and actually spread it out and dry it out, but then it kind of got pretty crumbly and hard to, hard to work with. So I went to the library, and they fortunately had the exact same paper on the microfiche, so I copied it all. It's out on the table. Please help yourself. Pick it up and look at it. It's really kind of neat reading. So all the pages that are out there, Go ahead and read it. I, it. It's fairly legible if you got good eyes, but kind of neat to, to see the times at the time. Um, some of the things that were happening at that was a very uh, eventful day. The Queen of England had, was being buried that day, Queen Alexandra of England. There was an article in the headline, the Reichstag, which was the German government between the First World War and when Hitler uh, assumed power, uh, approved a some kind of a treaty with the League of Nations, which was a precursor to the United Nations. Um, there was a kind of an interesting article about the uh, state of Wisconsin granting incorporation uh, permission for the Ku Klux Klan on that particular day. And just a lot of interesting stuff. There was a, a Valders basketball game. I think they beat Reedsville 17 to four. So <laughs> very low scoring games at that time. But there's just a lot of interesting information, so that's out there. Go ahead and read it if you like. Uh, help yourself to that paper. We're going to leave this up for a couple weeks, all the stuff out there, so people have a chance to look at it. Yeah, it was kind of fascinating things as you go through it. If, um, coincidentally, we've been going through some stuff at home on our farm and found photographs that fit, or, or that f we matched. And uh, so some of the photos that, many of the photos and things out there are stuff that we've recently kind of unearthed on our own property. Yep. So the question was, how do you present this so everybody can look at it? And this is what we settled on as a way of doing it is, uh, you know, they're out there, actual items are out there, but we tried to find recreations of those same items in a form that you can actually look at. So there's some things out there that you can handle and some things you can't. Uh, like I said, the newspaper, please help yourself. It's interesting to read those times and understand what's going on in those times. So the construction started was in the September of 1925, and this is the article. So I'm gonna try to read it as we go through. Uh, I'm actually gonna read it off my screen because it's a little difficult to read. Um, so the, the, this, the article re referring to the church is this one. One, 
One founder of church to see the service, the first attendant in 1861 to witness an unveiling of the Moore Memorial. Sunday will be a memorial, memorable day for the congregation at St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Michigan, marking the unveiling of the nameplate and memorial tablet of the new church which is under construction, which will be completed next summer. The date will be more memorable, however, to one person present at the ceremony because it will air memories of a day nearly 65 years ago when she was present at the first services, resulting in the founding of the congregation. Mrs. Doris Blum, now past 80 years of age, is the sole survivor of the little band which on May 20th, 1861, laid the foundation of the organization which is soon to realize an ambition of years and dedication of the new church home. Mrs. Blum has anticipated the Sunday, ceremony Sunday with much pleasure and will be honored by the congregation on that occasion. So the program of service, the ceremonies will begin at 215 with the Reverend Paul Kianka of Maribel, whose church, new church there was recently dedicated, and Philip Freilich of Appleton, who will deliver addresses in birth English and German in the old church, and the congregation will then repair to the site of the new structure for the unveiling ceremony. Walls of the new church are up 10 feet. The tablet, we are, the tablet to be unveiled, which is the cornerstone out there, is a slab of Tennessee marble matching in color the granite and, the, and will bear the inscription, St. Peter's Lutheran, 1861 to 1925. The Reverend Edward Zell, pastor of the church, will be in charge of the ceremonies. The history of the church, the men who fathered the Lutheran congregation in Mexicot 60 year, odd years ago were John Balls, Carl Schwein, Friedrich Schneider, Mr. Jens, Johann Siebert, Friedrich George, Louis Bartels, who happens to be my grandfather's brother, Friedrich Cruz, and Carl Wilsman, all of whom have passed on. The date of the organization was May 20th, 1861. The first services were conducted in a schoolhouse by the Reverend Galdummer, then mass pastor of the Manitowoc congregation, and one of the pioneer preachers of the Wisconsin Synod. Uh, the Michigan Lutherans have been affiliated with the latter body since that time. That we don't have the rest of the article I don't have up there, so I'll just have to read it off here. When the congregation was order, organized, and a pastor Bartles, who was not a relative, was called to the pulpit, the Michigan congregation became his subcharge in 1863 to 68. His immediate successors were Pastor Quell. 65 to 68, and Zerberbeer, 68 to 72. Under the latter's administration, the present property was acquired. From 1872 to 74, the Michigan pulpit was supplied by Nittman and Frankenstein. When Frankenstein was the first past resident pastor left, Michigan was served by Pastor Yeager, both from his earlier station in Two Rivers and his later station in Gibson. So thus, Michigan became a subcharge of the Gibson congregation, and this connection lasted until 1882 when Yeager accepted a new call. Subsequently, for 20 years, Michicot was again supplied by the pastor of the Two Rivers Church to it, John Philip Kaler, from 82 to 88, now director of the seminary at Wauwatosa, A.F. Ziegler, 88 to 92, now retired, and Charles Dorner, 92 to 02, now in charge of the sister congregation in Escanaba, Michigan. In the year 1902, the Michigan Lutheran gathered together with those in Kasuth, organized an independent parish, Rockwood, and since then, the pastors have had the residence at Michigan. Gustav Vader, now at Cataract, Wisconsin, P.H. Dornfeld, Pastor St. Mark's Milwaukee, and Edward Zell. I'm going to scroll up here. Present incumbent. So then, Michigan now supplies the pulpit at Kasuth, Rockwood, and laterally also the Jambo Creek congregation. The building of proper was begun on September 22nd, the foundation having been completed sometime earlier. The walls are being erected according to the flag method of granite spalls and con solid concrete. The inclemency of the fall weather has not permitted uninterrupted, uninterrupted pouring of the concrete and building operations will now be suspended until spring. So that was the article in the paper, kind of neat. I'll talk a little bit about that flag mess of construction a little bit later on. So on the upper right you see the parsonage, that's the parsonage we remember. Um, there was an addition, an addition on the front of it, that just makes it a little, a little bit different. And then to the left of the parsonage, that is the site of the, old, of the original church. So it's essentially in our gathering space. That was where the church was originally. Uh, the lower picture is at the actual dedication ceremony of the new church in 1927. The drawing, to try to give you some idea, um, we're going to post this presentation on Facebook too so you can review it again if you like. So you can kind of see where the parsonage outline is. Basically the parsonage, the uh, drive through is where the parsonage was and the church would be where the uh, gathering, new gathering space is and then the new church was built all to the east, to the west of that. Um, the old structure, my grandfather was on the building committee and purchased the old structure and tore it down and repurposed it. 
So the building still stands, or lumber from the building still stands. This is actually on our farm. So it was turned into a chicken coop. Some of the, the, the windows, those ac windows actually in the old church were full length. We, the bottoms were, were uh, closed up at one point, but, um, and there still is leftover lumber stored up and way above in one of the barns that we haven't cleaned out since 1925. So <laughs> it's all there if anybody wants to help us clean it out. Actually, there was a, an idea of making a, one of those, those library share boxes out of that lumber and having it in front of the church. That would be kind of a neat idea. So if anybody wants to do a little project with some of that lumber, there, there's still lumber available from it. So this is a picture of actually my grandfather pulling it home. Uh, you can kind of see the, the 40 foot long, it was probably the top truss pieces. I'm guessing that's where the trusses were sitting in those. Um, kind of neat stuff. The, the uh, stone for the building was all hauled from Francis Crick. It was railed to Francis Crick, and then members used their wagons, and I'm not sure how much was trucking and how much was horse drawn, but used their wagons to bring all the stone to the building. So at the completion, you see there was a, the, uh, we hosted the Manitowoc Conference, and that was the, all the ladies who did the cooking for the conference at this meeting, and down below was the building committee. Um, we've got their names in a, in a later slide. So this was the groundbreaking, and we we're talking about a field. <laughs> they started from zero. So on the, the uh, from left to right is Reverend Zell, uh, Mr. Teelbar, George Bartles, my grandfather, H. Eckert, Brand, I don't know the first name, Paul Saloff, Richard Trader, and George Jindra. So that was the original uh, building committee. So this is a little bit of an insight into the construction. So the flag method of construction was basically not putting stone up as a mason and mortaring them in. You basically stack the stone, leaving gaps in between. You put a form behind it, and then you poured concrete in behind it, and you filled all the spaces with concrete after the stone was put up. In, in some cases, you actually just kept slipping that, sh that form up as you went, and you kind of poured as you went. Um, notice the little hand mixer. Every shovel of mortar in this building went through that little hand mixer. Uh, that was just plain work. So this was the dedication, the finishing of the dedication. Uh, and the attendance at the dedication. And this is just a, a picture of the trustees at that later time. So Hugo Holst, H. Teelbar, Eckert, uh, Reverend Zell, Wirtz, Wenholz, and Redeker. Moving forward in time, this, most many of you don't remember, this was a church before the school edition. There was a small room in the back that was torn off when we put the school edition on. And this is the groundbreaking from that, 1972, with Pastor Kesting. Um, some of the building committee at that time, uh, Delmer Dvorak, uh, Ray Wiebens own, my dad, um, trying to think who else was on there. There were a number of them. Uh, oh yeah, and Mar Fleck, yeah. The choir was off on the, that was the choir singing off there in the back. So, yep. Uh, somewhere in there. So, kind of neat stuff. Um, please take time to go check it out. And like I said, the, the, the things you can, we, it doesn't pay to have this stuff packed away in a book. Have, let's have people come out and look at it. So we'll leave it out for a couple weeks. People get an opportunity to look at it and we'll put this presentation up on the, on the uh, Facebook page as well. I think I covered everything I wanted to. Um, the, the newspaper is very interesting reading. As I said, you get to, it gives you a flavor of the times. Um, it was just as gossipy as it is now. So there's an article about Frank Lloyd White's third wife divorcing him because she caught him with another woman. So <laughs> they were... Uh, and there was also, interestingly, a court case of a New York socialite who was being disinherited by his father. And he was suing his wife because his father was disinheriting him because his wife did not admit that she had Negro heritage in her blood. So that's an interesting court case. So she was being prosecuted for not admitting her lineage, and she ultimately prevailed and got money out of him, so good for her. Uh, but yeah, so there's, it, it's just kind of fascinating reading about the times, and, and the, the prose of the newspaper is much, great. you know, it had to be very descriptive. You couldn't watch it on TV, so you had to be very descriptive. So the, the Queen's funeral talks about her funeral casket being born from Westminster Abbey to wherever, and snow gently settling on the casket and creating a white blanket, and 
then referring back to when she was married, it snowed that day apparently too, and just a lot of neat, a lot of neat stuff. Uh, so it's out there, help yourself. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just another reminder, if you would, please make use of the friendship registers. They're located at the ends of your pew. We're going to kind of start using those again as you're comfortable. Um, feel free to stick around. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. Uh, there is a private baptism immediately following the service, so if you're maybe not congregating too much in here, uh, we'll eventually open it back up. I will have the slideshow that we just kind of watched going in here, but it will also be on camera out on the TV out there um, following the baptism as well. So that's it for announcements. Stick around as, as long as you need. And then, yeah, um, just deciding today with all the stuff going on, uh, we're going to dispense with Bible, Bible study. We'll continue next week. We